Initial anticoagulant treatment of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy. What is the initial treatment of VTE in pregnancy? In clinically suspected deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, treatment with low molecular weight heparin or LMWH should be commenced immediately until the diagnosis is excluded by objective testing unless treatment is strongly contraindicated. Low molecular weight heparins or LMWH are more effective are associated with a lower risk of hemorrhagic complications and are associated with lower mortality than unfractionated heparin in the initial treatment of DVT in non-pregnant patients. LMWH treatment was associated with lower rates of VTE recurrence or extension. There is evidence that low molecular weight heparins do not cross the placenta. Low molecular weight heparin is a safe and effective alternative to unfractionated heparin as an anticoagulant during pregnancy. One of the advantages of low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin is the potential reduced risk of bleeding. This of particular relevance in obstetric practice where obstetric hemorrhage remains the most common cause of severe obstetric morbidity. Low molecular weight heparins are not associated with an increased risk of severe postpartum hemorrhage, defined as a blood loss of 1,000 milliliters or more in vaginal delivery. It is known that the risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT, is substantially lower with low molecular weight heparin use compared with unfractionated heparin. Data on LMWH also substantiate a lower risk of low molecular weight heparin compared with unfractionated heparin for heparin-induced osteoporosis. In clinically suspected venous thromboembolism, low molecular weight heparin should be postponed until objective testing has confirmed the diagnosis in women at risk of bleeding after careful consideration of the balance of risk of hemorrhage and clotting. Women who are known to be allergic to low molecular weight heparin should be offered an alternative anticoagulant preparation. What is the therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin in pregnancy? LMWH should be given in doses titrated against the woman's booking or early pregnancy weight. There is insufficient evidence to recommend whether the dose of LMWH should be given once daily or in two divided doses. There should be clear local guidelines for the dosage of low molecular weight heparin to be used. During pregnancy, changes in volume of distribution and renal glomerular filtration rate result in alterations in the pharmacokinetics of low molecular weight heparins. Several studies have provided reassuring data on safety and efficacy of once a daily dosing. Table number 1a. Initial dose of enoxaparin is determined as follows. Booking or early pregnancy weight, less than 50 kg. Initial dose of enoxaparin, 40 mg twice daily or 60 mg once daily. 50 to 69 kg. 60 mg twice daily or 90 mg once daily, 70 to 89 kg, 80 mg twice daily or 120 mg once daily, 90 to 109 kg, 100 mg twice daily or 150 mg once daily, 110 to 125 kg, 120 mg twice daily or 180 mg once daily. Greater than 125 kg should be discussed with hematologist. Table number 1b. Initial dose of daltaparin is determined as follows. Booking or early pregnancy weight, less than 50 kg. Initial dose of daltaparin, 
5,000 international units or IU twice daily or 10,000 IU once daily. 50 to 69 kilograms, 6,000 IU twice daily or 12,000 IU once daily. 70 to 89 kilograms, 8,000 IU twice daily or 16,000 IU once daily. 90 to 109 kilograms, 10,000 IU twice daily or 20,000 IU once daily. 110 to 125 kilograms, 12,000 IU twice daily or 24,000 IU daily. Greater than 125 kilograms should be discussed with hematologist. Table number 1C. Initial dose of tenzaparine is determined as follows. Initial dose of tenzaparine based on booking or early pregnancy weight, 175 units per kilograms once daily. Lower doses of low molecular weight heparin should be employed if the creatinine clearance is less than 30 mm per minute in oxaparin and deltaparin or less than 20 ml per minute with tenzaparin. Should blood tests be performed to monitor heparin therapy in pregnancy? Routine measurement of peak anti-10A activity for patients on low molecular weight heparin for treatment of acute venous thromboembolism in pregnancy or postpartum is not recommended, except in women at extremes of body weight less than 50 kg and 90 kg or more, or with other complicating factors, for example, with renal impairment or recurrent venous thromboembolism. Routine platelet count monitoring should not be carried out. Obstetric patients who are post-operative and receiving unfractionated heparin should have platelet count monitoring performed every 2-3 to three days from days 4 to 14 or until heparin is stopped. The platelet count should be checked after 24 hours of initiating treatment if the patient has previously received heparin, unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin in the last 100 days. The frequency of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT is greater in surgical than medical patients and is more likely with unfractionated heparin. How should massive life-threatening pulmonary embolism in pregnancy and the puerperium be managed? Collapse shocked women who are pregnant or in the puerperium should be assessed by a team of experienced clinicians including the on-call consultant obstetrician. Women should be managed on an individual basis regarding intravenous and fractionated heparin, thrombolytic therapy, or thoracotomy and surgical embolectomy. Management should involve a multidisciplinary team including senior physicians, obstetricians, and radiologists. Intravenous and fractionated heparin is the preferred initial treatment in massive pulmonary embolism with cardiovascular compromise. Maternity units should develop guidelines for the administration of intravenous and fractionated heparin. The on-call medical team should be contacted immediately. An urgent portable echocardiogram or CTPA within one hour of presentation should be arranged. If massive pulmonary embolism is confirmed, or in extreme circumstances prior to confirmation, immediate thrombolysis should be considered. Massive pulmonary embolism may present with shock, refractory hypoxemia, and or right ventricular dysfunction on echocardiogram and is a medical emergency. Collapse shocked women who are pregnant or in the puerperium should be assessed by a multidisciplinary resuscitation team of experienced clinicians, including the on-call consultant obstetrician, who should decide on an individual basis whether a woman receives intravenous and fractionated heparin, thrombolytic therapy, or thoracotomy and surgical embolectomy. Maternal resuscitation should commence following the principles of ABC, 
and if cardiac arrest occurs, cardiopulmonary resuscitation should be performed with the woman in a left lateral tilt. A perimortem cesarean section should be performed by 5 minutes if resuscitation is unsuccessful and the pregnancy is more than 20 weeks. Intravenous and fractionated heparin is a preferred initial treatment in massive pulmonary embolism because of its rapid effect, extensive experience on its use in this situation, and since it can be adjusted more readily if thrombolytic therapy is administered. One regimen for the administration of intravenous and fractionated heparin is loading dose of 80 units per kilogram followed by a continuous intravenous infusion of 18 units per kilogram per hour. If a patient has received a thrombolysis, the loading dose of heparin should be omitted and an infusion started at 18 units per kilogram per hour. It is mandatory to measure activated partial thromboplastin time or APTT level 4 to 6 hours after the loading dose, 6 hours after any dose change, and then at least daily when in the therapeutic range. The therapeutic target APTT ratio is usually 1.5 to 2.5 times the average laboratory control value. It is recognized that activated partial thromboplastin time monitoring of unfractionated heparin is technically problematic, particularly in late pregnancy when an apparent heparin resistance of course, due to increased fibrinogen and factor 8, which influence the activated partial thromboplastin time. This can lead to unnecessarily high doses of heparin being used with subsequent hemorrhagic problems. Where such problems are considered to exist, hematologists should be involved in the patient's management. It may be useful to determine the anti 10A level as a measure of heparin dose. With unfractionated heparin, a lower level of anti-10A is considered therapeutic, target range 0.35 to 0.7 units per ml or 0.5 to 1.0 units per ml for patients with life-threatening pulmonary embolism. In massive life-threatening pulmonary embolism with hemodynamic compromise, or with limb or life-threatening ischemic complications from extensive iliofemoral vein thrombosis, thrombolytic therapy should be considered as anticoagulant therapy alone will not reduce the obstruction in the circulation. After thrombolytic therapy has been given, an infusion of unfractionated heparin can be given, but the loading dose should be omitted. Thrombolytic therapy is more effective than heparin therapy in reducing clot burden and improving hemodynamics. Current recommendations suggest that thrombolytic therapy should be reserved for patients with severe pulmonary thromboembolism with hemodynamic compromise. A major concern regarding the use of thrombolytic therapy in pregnancy is fetal and maternal bleeding. If the patient is not suitable for thrombolysis, or is moribund, a discussion with the cardiothoracic surgeons with a view to urgent thoracotomy should be had. Additional therapies. Should graduated elastic compression stockings be employed in the acute management of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy, in the initial management of DVT, the leg should be elevated, and a graduated elastic compression stocking applied to reduce edema. Mobilization with graduated elastic compression stockings should be encouraged. Randomized control trials have shown that early ambulation with leg compression does not increase the risk of pulmonary embolism, does not increase thrombus propagation, and that pain and swelling improved faster compared to those patients who had their mobility restricted. This approach may also prevent the development of post-thrombotic syndrome. National guidance in the UK recommends that patients with proximal DVT or deep vein thrombosis 
should be offered below knee compression stockings with an ankle pressure greater than 23 millimeters of mercury and that hoistery does not need to be worn on the unaffected leg. Accurate fitting and careful instruction in the correct application of the hoistery is essential to avoid discomfort and assist rather than prevent a venous return. What is the role of inferior vena cava filters in the management of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy? Consideration should be given to the use of a temporary inferior vena cava filter in the peripartum period for patients with iliac vein venous thromboembolism to reduce the risk of pulmonary embolism or in patients with proven deep vein thrombosis and who have recurrent pulmonary embolism despite adequate anticoagulation. Placement of temporary inferior vena cava or IVC filter in obstetric practice is indicated when recurrent thromboembolism occurs despite adequate anticoagulation or when anticoagulation is contraindicated such as the peripartum period. The long-term safety of IVC filters is uncertain and the main complications associated with vena cava filters are migration, an increased risk of lower limb DVT, and caval thrombosis, and rarely infection.